Hi, Jim Wilson here. Welcome back to NGB Ideas. This podcast is about the journey of today's leaders, innovators, and disruptors in the Canadian life sciences sector, and it's brought to you by LabOccupier.com. McMaster Innovation Park in Hamilton is on a path to becoming one of the leading university research parks in not only Canada, but quite possibly in North America. The person who is charting that course is our guest today, the CEO of MIP, Ty Shattuck. I hope you enjoyed listening to our conversation. In the late 1980s, I was a student at McMaster. I was doing my, my master's degree, and I lived in an apartment at Longwood in Maine. And it overlooked Highway 403, but also a really heavy industrial park on the other side of the highway. And I remember standing on my balcony having a coffee on a regular basis thinking, I wonder if that land is ever going to change or if it always is going to be tied to manufacturing. And here we are 30 years later, and that land is tied to manufacturing, but it's not the manufacturing that I thought. That park was eventually purchased by MIP, which is McMaster Innovation Park. Our guest today is the CEO, Ty Shattuck. Ty, it's great to have you join us. Welcome to NGB Ideas. Hi, Jim. It's good to be with you. I'm looking forward to the chat. Likewise. So NGB Ideas is about the journey of leaders, innovators, and disruptors in Canada's life sciences sector, and your journey is really interesting. So if you don't mind, I'd appreciate starting where you're from. You were born in Alberta, correct? Yeah, way back when I I'm originally uh, was born in Calgary, Alberta. Your dad was a cowboy. So I was born in Calgary. Like I said, I actually don't exactly know what his job was. I think he probably worked for some oil company or something. But shortly thereafter, we moved to a Black Diamond south of Calgary. And yeah, he was a cowboy on a, on a cattle ranch. At some point, he decided being a cowboy wasn't for him. And you moved. Yeah. So there was a long history of moves. I don't exactly recall all of those things, but he was a, he worked on a cattle ranch. My dad, way before I was born, was in the Navy and he was a radio operator. Then he refound his calling and he joined uh, Transport Canada as an air radio operator. You hear about air traffic control. They control you when you're landing or taking off. But between those flights, you're under control of what's called air, air radio operations. And that, that's the role my dad took on. Oh, okay. You did a bunch of moving, and you eventually ended up in Nunavut for a while. Yeah, no, I was all over the map. We went from Calgary to Black Diamond, Black Diamond to Saskatchewan. He worked in a paper mill, then he joined Transport Canada. We went to Ottawa, where he did his training, back to Saskatchewan, and then we end up in a place called Baker Lake. It's now Nunavut. It was back then, it was Baker Lake, Northwest Territories, 1,000 miles due north of Winnipeg. And you did grades two to seven in Baker Lake. And so you would have been, what, eight yeah. to 13 years old. What was growing yeah, up exactly. Northwest Territories at the time? What was that like? I would say it was like growing up anywhere else. You went to school and stuff, <laughs> but it was just really cold. Look, it was a remarkable experience. At the time, there was less than a thousand people in the hamlet. There was no road, so nobody had cars. You had a snowmobile in the winter and a, an ATV for the summer. And I remember things like uh, recess would be canceled because there was like, a bear or a wolf in town. Yeah, it was a really interesting thing. But we, yeah, we were up there for what, four and a half years or so. It was a remarkable experience. It's a, it's an amazing place. I don't think people, in, or Canadians, I should say, appreciate just how diverse our country is. Culturally and geographically, it's like a completely different world up there. I love going up to the Arctic, and I, I look forward to my next trip. From Nunavut, you went south to Thunder Bay and finished middle school and then started high school. Yep. But you weren't finished moving. Where'd you go after Thunder Bay? So I started high school in Thunder Bay, and then we moved south again to Sault Ste. Marie, and I finished my high school in Sault Ste. Marie. All of that moving and changing schools every few years must have been tough on a kid growing up. Yeah. You know, at the time, I didn't, I certainly didn't enjoy all the moving and stuff. I always envy when you meet people and they've had friends that they had since kindergarten. I have no idea what that's like. I've since reconnected with some friends that I've known at various points. I think two things happened is I learned to, to jump into new environments and kind of land on your feet and figure out how to socialize whether you call that a chameleon or you just learn to figure out how to fit in. 
but it also made my brother and I really close because he was the only the only person uh, apart from my parents that I saw on a, on a consistent basis growing up. After graduating, you went to Kingston and attended Royal Military College of Canada. RMC, I am not intimately familiar with. It's a great institution, and it's one that is arguably a non-traditional academic path in Canada. Why did you choose to go there? Oh, Jim, that's a complicated question. When I graduated from high school, I'll say I did very good in high school, and I had the option to go pretty much anywhere I wanted scholarships everywhere I wanted, but oh my God, Jim, I was the ultra nerd, which kind of is inconsistent with what I just said that I knew how to fit in. I actually haven't figured that stuff out. I'm still the ultra nerd. I was a nerd, but I was also kind of a romantic. I've always had a quest for adventure. I wanted to do my engineering degree, but I also wanted to have an adventure. My dad had been in the military. I toured uh, the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, and I toured RMC, and I was thinking, wow, this sounds like not only do I get my academic side, but it's going to force me to be uncomfortable, which it did really well. So I ended up going to RMC. I would say the academics are the same thing that you get anywhere else, but you add military leadership, you add athletics, you add bilingualism. So it's a very, very different experience than the average university experience. And you graduated with a bachelor's degree in computer engineering out of the Department of Electrical Engineering. Is that the degree that you were pursuing day one, or did you pivot at some point and go, oh, yeah, that, that's where I'm heading? So when you do engineering, at least where I did engineering, the first couple of years are common, and then you have to pick a track. I think I'd always had a bias towards electrical engineering, but electrical engineering had different tracks. You could do power systems, you could do digital systems, and then computer engineering. I hated thermodynamics. I just did. And computer engineering was the only program that I didn't have to take any more thermodynamic. That was kind of the deal breaker. <laughs> <laughs> Path of least resistance. <laughs> exactly. It was a good fit. You had one professor in particular at RMC that impressed you quite a bit, and he was on assignment from Annapolis, which is, for our listeners, the Navy College in the United States. What about him do you remember? He taught control systems, and he was a Navy SEAL. Again, he was an active U.S. Navy member, but there was all sorts of active members at RMC. He was the first uh, U.S. SEAL that I'd ever met, and he was a fantastic professor. He knew his technical stuff, but oh my God, he was a great guy. And I learned so much from him, both on the technical side, but I also remember he would invite the whole class to the Army-Navy game. And as a Canadian, that wasn't a big deal. You're like, what's an Army-Navy game? But if you're a Navy SEAL, that's a big deal. And I remember us, him inviting us all over to his house, but we all watched the Army-Navy game. I'll never forget that. That must have been a really cool experience. Military college is a rigorous environment, and I've always thought at its heart, it's a, one of the goals is to train the next generation of leaders. Is, is that a fair comment? That's absolutely its purpose. It's unabashedly you're there to learn how to be a leader. That's it. And there's a lot of dimensions to that. There's an academic component and there's a military component and a social component and an athletic component, but that's, that's its sole purpose is to, is to train leaders. Did you play any sports when you were at RMC? I did. I was on varsity judo and then I, uh, I morphed away from that. I ended up playing the uh, inter volleyball. It's quite a switch. I wasn't very high up in the belt of judo. But it turns out I was a pretty good scrapper. Well, there was this black belt. I remember his name was M Mazer. And he was like six foot seven. Nobody was on par with him. So I was the closest thing to a competition. Every day we would go to the dojo and he would just beat the crap out of me. <laughs> <laughs> For a year. <laughs> and I became a better fighter, never as good or as big as him. That becomes quite wearing after a while. <laughs> and so as I morphed into my final year, I'm like, I, I think I'm going to do something a little less rigorous and focus on my academics. I'm sure that was a good move in hindsight. <laughs> we did all sorts of sports, but those were my main sports. I also sailed there too. There was sailing. I like to sail. And so I, I continued my passion at, at RMC as well. One thing I've learned in doing this podcast is to prepare myself to be humbled at some point in every interview. And I mentioned in my intro that I was doing a master's degree at McMaster, and 
I did my undergrad at, at Western, and both of my degrees were focused on Canadian history, which remains a love, and it taught me how to research and write and present, which is what I do every day in commercial real estate. But this is where I get humbled in this interview, because your undergraduate thesis, and I hope I get this right, was about suborbital rocket systems. <laughs> Could you tell me a bit about that? There's a theme. Remember the nerdy, nerdy theme that we started with? My thesis, we combined. Remember, I was in computer engineering. We partnered with a guy, a great friend of mine, in mechanical engineering, and we designed and developed a suborbital rocket system. He designed the rocket system and, and the engine system. I designed the inertial navigation system. And that thesis took you to a national competition, didn't it? Yeah. We went to a national engineering competition for undergraduate engineering projects. I remember we all was at Winnipeg University of Manitoba, and we, we presented there. We didn't win, but it was pretty cool to go there. And the last time I was at RMC, it was still on display. I don't know if it's still there. That is so cool. Like, if you're going to do something, you might as well do something fun and interesting. Yeah, in work as well, which we're going to get to. <laughs> I understand that RMC, at least my impression, is that you get an education at the government's expense, and in exchange, you spend time working in the Canadian Armed Forces. Is that still the case? That's right. The deal is that they pay for your education, and then you have to return the favor by spending so much time in, in the Armed Forces. And you chose the Air Force. It was five years with the Air Force, and I was aerospace engineering officer. Why the Air Force? I like rockets. I would also say that I've always had a fascination for aerospace and planes and rockets and stuff like that. And I've just always had a passion for that. So when you have to pick your degree, which was computer engineering, then you have to pick your element. And so I chose the Air Force and I wasn't coordinated enough to be a pilot or something cool. So I went into aerospace engineering. So, And where was your primary posting? Well, you have a number of postings. So I did training postings in Camp Gordon, which is just around Barrie. I did a posting to Comox. Uh, probably the longest posting was to Canadian Forces Cold Lake. And then from Cold Lake, I was detached to Orlando. But those were my major posts. You eventually left the Armed Forces in the 1990s and ended up joining a small startup in Hamilton called West Camp. That was in 1995? Yes. I'm guessing transitioning from military to civilian life is difficult at the best of times. But on top of that, you went from the very structured military environment to a startup environment, which is probably one extreme to the other. That path would have been very difficult for anyone. I think it, it was even more difficult given the jump that you were making. Do you remember what that period was like? I remember that well, Jim. And let me say, as, as an aerospace engineer in Cold Lake, more specifically with my background, I was writing software for the Australian, Kiwi, and Canadian uh, F-18 fleets. So I was in the far north writing code in a uniform. That was my major function. At the time, if you think back to the mid-90s, you know, the, the Iron Curtain had fallen. There was, there was lots of opportunities to kind of move on, and I was looking to get my master's degree. So I joined Westcam, which you said was a startup. It wasn't a one-person startup. I think there was about 20 or 25 people in a garage. I wasn't important enough to be in the garage. I was in the Atco trailer beside the garage. But Jim, the transition wasn't as hard as I thought, but I was terrified of it. And I had no idea if I would be able to make it in the civilian world. I had a backup plan. I always have a plan B in whatever I do. And my plan B is, remember, I was from Alberta, so I had a pickup truck. I had enough money saved up that I could buy a camper for my pickup truck. In the event that I couldn't make it as, as an engineer in the civilian world, I was going to buy a camper for my pickup truck and go to Lake Louise and be a ski instructor. That was my backup plan. And I've always regretted to some degree that I didn't at least do that for a couple of years because it turned out that the transition was okay. People are people. It was less structured for sure, but it worked out. Westcam is now part of L3 Technologies, correct? It's actually part of L3 Harris. Westcam was acquired by a company called L3 Communications. L3 Communications a couple of years ago merged with Harris Corporation. So in 2000, you became a professional engineer. You were still at Westcam? And in 2001, you achieved the Six Sigma Black Belt, which are both very difficult things to do. Where'd you find the time? Like, did you take time off work? How did you do that? 
I also got my master's degree between 99 and 2000. Just because you weren't busy enough. I always wanted to get my master's degree. How did I find the time? You know, Jim, it was difficult. I just love learning and having new ideas. The Six Sigma Black Belt was really how do you design companies and organizations to be more efficient, not on the capital side. And so as I went in my career, I kind of become less technical and more focused on the business piece. Kind of me following my passion. That's the secret, in my opinion, to being motivated is do something that you like and have a passion for, and then it doesn't feel like work. That's always been my motto. If you're going to do something, do something that's interesting that you enjoy, and then you can put your back into it. It doesn't feel like... It gets you out of bed in the morning. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You became a vice president at Westcam, and you were responsible for design and performance. Was this your first step up the management ladder? And I wonder if that ladder was something you were pushed up or that you consciously started to climb. I would say I consciously started to climb, but I was pushed and pulled in different directions. Earlier, I thought I would be on a technical stream, and I was maybe pushed more into the business, and I think that was a good thing. Westcam made aerial camera systems, and it was interesting that they had just moved into defense applications. And with a defense background, I was a great fit, and I moved from software and systems engineering into program management. And the company was growing leaps and bounds. It was a really a remarkable time. And I would say when you do project or program management, you kind of see all the warts in the organization because your job is to deliver stuff. The president at the time, a gentleman by the name of Mark Chamberlain, said, I, I want somebody to help me re-engineer. That was a big phrase back then, re-engineer. Westcam for the next phase of gross. And so we're going to give you training. We're going to give you this Six Sigma Black Belt training and did lean training and quality and performance was really redesigning the entire company, how it operated for its next phase of growth. It was really intriguing. I've since moved into business design, but it was my first foray that instead of designing a product, I'm now designing a, how a business operates. You're still in the design mode, but you're designing something else. You're designing the machine that makes the product, not the machine, but the business organization. I'll give credit to Mark. He pushed me in that direction. I wanted to move up, and that was a good direction to go. And, and again, I kind of found a passion. Westcam L3 was growing, and I suspect given what they do, you were spending a fair amount of time down in the U.S. and rather than in Canada. You left Westcam in 2005 to become chief operating officer at an early stage investment company called Triveris. Why did you move? What was it that attracted you to that position? I'd been at Westcam for the greater part of 10 years. I think it was just shy of 10 years. Westcam, I think at the time, we were doing about $200 million. It was a public company. And then we got gobbled up by a U.S. holding company. I'm not sure if you've ever worked for a U.S. holding company, but it has a very different culture and a di very different feel. And I did that as a sector vice president for three years. And I would say, remember, I was in the business design piece. And although that was great to learn, I love doing business, not just being supportive of the business. And, it, and I felt I wanted to be a little closer to the action. And I think smaller was more interesting to me. So a couple of us, including Mark Chamberlain, who was the CEO of Westcam. So we, we started this early stage business. We, we were naive enough to think a couple of engineers knew how to be venture capitalists. I have nothing bad to say about L3 or L3 Harris now. This was an opportunity to, to do something new and different. So you were at Traveris for just under five years and left to become president and eventually CEO of PV Labs. And that company was also part of Traveris, and it's still based in Burlington, Ontario. What was the focus at Traveris? Traveris was what would today be called a venture creation company. So what we would do is we would find novel technologies, normally a twinkling or engineer or researcher's eye. And then we would go create the venture. So it wasn't a VC where people would come and present and we'd say, oh, invest or not invest. We would actually go create the ventures themselves. And I was the chief operating officer. My job was to make sure all of the companies had a team, had a strategy, had the capital, and, and were growing. So I was spread across many companies, which was great. We were trying to grow that. But at some point, and there was, you remember in that period, there was 2008, there was a small downturn in the economy. It was decided rather than keep growing the portfolio, let's focus with what was in the portfolio. And PV Labs was kind of the biggest in the portfolio. So I went from on the investor side that I took control of PV Labs. And I'd been all involved, 
but I was more involved on the investment and oversight, and then I took on the president CEO role. That was your first stint as a CEO at PV Labs? Yeah, that was my first. It went back to Westcam. So PV Labs made uh, aerial camera systems for movies and for surveillance and infrastructure. It did more than just the imagery. It also did the back-end processing. Do you recall what it was like stepping into that CEO's office on the first day and saying, hey, here I am? It was a pretty small team that I took over. So it wasn't like I was saying, here I am to a whole bunch of people. And remember, I'd been there for quite a while. It actually felt pretty comfortable. All the way back to why did I go to RMC? It felt quite comfortable and it was exciting. It was super exciting that now I wasn't in one of the silos. I was in charge of making sure all the silos played nice to each other. I would assume that that comfort level just immediately affirms that you made the right decision. Yeah, absolutely. Being CEO is good. I don't think it's as glorious as people imagine. 70% dealing with administrative and HR stuff. People think that you spend all of your days on strategy. <laughs> you spend a little bit of your time on strategy. That's certainly fun. But the majority of your time is, is keeping the organization rolling. So you were at PV Labs for just over 10 years. And from there, you went to Aeson Technologies in Toronto. What brought you there? So at one point, PV Labs, we had different sectors. And so I would say it was almost not a breakup, that's the wrong word, but we broke the company into different pieces with different areas of focus. PV Labs had at its core stabilization technologies that had its Westcam heritage. So a few of us spun out and we wanted to focus in on the image and the software processing of image analytics. So we created a new company. The initial focus was actually on what's called nano satellites. We partnered with some folks in the States and we were going to put up a suite, what's called a constellation of nanosats. The original name of Athon was called Six Imaging. Do you know what a nanosat? It's a low Earth orbit satellite. It was a brilliant model. And about six months after we started that, Google invested in our largest competitor. <laughs> And it kind of took the wind out of our sails. And so we pivoted away from just satellites into broader imaging, infrastructure mapping, and stuff like that. And we renamed the company ASON. This entrepreneurship, you have to be prepared that things change and you have to pivot. Yeah. And you were part of the ownership team. Yes. Yeah. At the company. And you sold ASON in 2017. You had a short stint as a CTO with another company. And then in 2018, you had a call about McMaster Innovation Park. Did you call them? Did they call you? How did that happen? A bit of both. What I didn't say is that when McMaster Innovation Park opened, Triveris, that venture capital company that I mentioned, we were a founding tenant. I remember when MIP was originally, remember they bought it from Westinghouse and the building and they were, we were a founding tenant at MIP. And I drank the Kool-Aid back then as the role of uh, Innovation Park. And so I actually knew some of the people that actually still work there. I was a tenant, not in the management team. And then after I'd sold Athon and was thinking about what the next chapter is, I was reached out by headhunters. And they said that the, my predecessor had retired and they were looking for a new strategy and was wondering if I was interested. And that, that's how it approached. But I'd kept in touch with them because MIP was a former home. I was well-versed in MIP but I wasn't expecting to become the CEO of MIP. I'd like to talk about three words individually, McMaster, innovation, and park. What is the relationship between McMaster and MIP? I'll give you the simplified version because we make everything as complicated as possible. McMaster Innovation Park is a company, formerly it's a trust, that we're owned by McMaster University. Actually in a trust, the university is the beneficiary, but you can think of it as a company with one shareholder, that, that shareholder is McMaster University, but we have our own board of directors. We operate independently. And I'm going to jump to the third term, park. Could you tell us a bit about the park itself? The park is a 58-anchor campus. It was prior to McMaster University owning it. It was an old Westinghouse campus. Westinghouse, incredibly innovative company. They made tanks and torpedoes at the park, and it was really as I understood it, like I wasn't around back then, kind of an industrial pillar of, of the community. And then all sorts of innovative. It's amazing how many companies that we think of actually spun out of Westinghouse facilities at the time. 
But eventually, Westinghouse found different areas, and so in the early 2000s, the, that area became up for, for sale, and McMaster University, seeing it was up for sale, said, why don't we acquire that property and create a research park or an innovation park? And 58 acres, as we sit here today, grow from 700 to about 3.5 million square feet over the next decade or so. Well, I'm thankful you called me a few years ago to work with the team at MIP on the real estate side of things, and we were fortunate to lend a CCRM and Omnia Bio, which is the anchor for the next generation of the park. Uh-huh. Before we go there, the park really is all about helping companies scale, and and I'm going to try to rein in my enthusiasm for MIP, but what is the goal of MIP? Fundamentally, the reason we exist is to help entrepreneurs, innovators, and ventures start, scale, and thrive. Why is that important? McMaster is a, a research powerhouse. They do phenomenal research, and not just in a local area, like on a global level, they're a research powerhouse. The challenge, and it's not a McMaster problem or a Hamilton problem, it's a Canadian problem, is we as a nation have not been very good from going from brilliant idea or discovery to impactful reality. And so the whole notion of the MIP, when it was originally envisioned, you know, 15, 16 years ago, was could you create a place, both a physical place, but more important, a culture, an environment, an ecosystem where we can take those brilliant ideas and bring them to life in a commercial sense. How do you create a place where that is? Universities are all about creating brilliant minds that create brilliant discoveries. MIP is when and if there's a commercial application, let's create that environment to bring it to life. You look at MIP and you go, oh, it's a bunch of buildings. And, and that's true. I would say if you looked at a hospital, you'd say, oh, look at that. There's a building. But a hospital's not interesting because of the building. It's interesting because what happens in the hospital, they're saving lives. A school has a building, but it's not interesting because it's a building. It's interesting what happens in the building is we're educating people so that they can fulfill their potential. An innovation park is the same thing. Yes, we have buildings, but it's not the buildings that make it interesting. It's what the people in those buildings are doing. Our job is to provide innovation infrastructure, the physical components that ventures need to start and scale and thrive. But not just the physical, make sure that all of the other things, whether it's capital, whether it's talent, whether it's a beer to cry into when your idea didn't go forward, (laughs) all of those things to bring your idea to life. And that's what MIP is all about. I would absolutely agree that Canadians are great at innovation, but we've done a terrible job at commercialization. And the role that MIP is playing is critical to the success of the next generation of the life sciences community and the industry across the country. I'd appreciate you commenting on MIP's partnership with CCRM and Omnia Bio and and what it means to the Ontario life sciences ecosystem. For those that don't know, CCRM, Center for Commercialization of Regenerative Medicine, was a spin out of University of Toronto and has its research headquarters in Mars. The purpose of CCRM, and it's a quasi-government funded entity, is to, for lack of a better thing, spin out new ventures and really support the development of the ecosystem. And they've spun out a whole bunch of things such as Notch that I know you're familiar with. And CCR is impressive in a whole bunch of dimensions. But its success isn't to be successful into itself. It's really the spin-outs, the children of CCRM is where the economic potential is. The latest spin-out from CCRM is OmniOBio, which is a CDMO, a contract, a development manufacturing organization focused on cell and gene therapy. And it's unlike CCRM, it's a for-profit, privately funded enterprise. And a couple of things that I think is really important. If you go back to what we just talked about, Canadian strength. We've all come through COVID. We're still somewhat in the midst of it. Anybody that's had those vaccines, all of those vaccines contain Canadian intellectual property to some extent. And yet those vaccines, at least the ones, the current generations, were not produced in Canada. We had to wait for other nations. You remember those dark days, Jim, where we had to wait for other nations to productize that intellectual property. And then we had to wait in line until they could give it to us. 
and we finally have it. And that's symptomatic of that lack of commercialization that you made reference to. Canadians were discovered stem cells, and it's a multi-billion dollar industry in Scandinavia. Canadians discovered insulin, and it's a multi-billion dollar industry elsewhere. We're great at the discovery, but we haven't been able to commercialize it and bring it home. And COVID highlighted why that's an unacceptable. Part of commercialization, A, it creates jobs and economic prosperity, but our citizens deserve to benefit from our own discoveries. Regenerative medicine is the next chapter in medicine. If you're not familiar with it, it's going to absolutely transform how medicine is done. We go from managing symptoms to curing diseases, curing chronic disease. It's going to revolutionize everything. This new chapter is an opportunity that hopefully 20 years from now, we don't talk about how regenerative medicine was developed in Canada and now is an industry somewhere else. We want to grow it in here and we want to be leaders for it. And that's the vision of CCRM, CCRM's CEO, Michael May, and Omniobio CEO, Mike Civilotti. Okay, let's do that. Part of that is how do we move from discovery to manufacturing? So they wanted to build a CDMO. And so they selected MIP as the place to build that CDMO. Moving down that continuum from discovery to reality is a big deal for the region. And frankly, for the country, we need to do that on a bunch of stuff. It's a huge deal for the region itself because, and frankly, MIP, its research headquarters is in Mars and remains in Mars. But you can't do biomanufacturing in downtown Toronto. There's no place to do that. So instead of discovering it in Mars and then shipping it off to somewhere in the States or Europe or Asia, you're going to ship it a little ways down the road and we're going to manufacture it there. It's both a symbol of the life science ecosystem maturing within the region, but it's also a symbol of Canada saying, you know what, we're going to lead in one of these areas. And I think it's hugely impactful. I'm highly biased, Jim. I share your bias. I think it's a huge deal. And a huge win for the city of Hamilton, too, because many people across Canada still view Hamilton as an industrial backwater with a good football team, in my estimation. It's got a fabulous university, McMaster, which you mentioned earlier. It's got a world-class health sciences organizations with Hamilton Health Sciences and St. Joseph's Healthcare with MIP and OmniaBio. I clearly see Hamilton entering what will be a renaissance year. And I don't mean to overstate it, but it's extraordinary what's going on in Hamilton. It's a really cool place. It is, Jim. Hamilton has so much potential, but we've been saying that for so long. That potential is being realized on so many fronts. What I think is super exciting, and you kind of see it in the rearview mirror, you may not see it when it's leading, is... The research in Mac is amazing, but what's happening in biomanufacturing really combines the research prowess and the life science prowess with the manufacturing prowess. And you may say, well, yeah, manufacturing steel and manufacturing gene therapies or radiopharmas, that's completely different. And it's actually not. It's a manufacturing process. The raw materials are different, but the skill set, the talent, the approach, so many parallels. And so the advanced manufacturing prowess of Hamilton is now merging with the research prowess and the global trend of life sciences. And it's all coming together and it's a perfect storm, but but a good storm. And it is transforming the city. We hope you're enjoying today's podcast and would like to remind our listeners that NGB Ideas is part of Next Great Big Ideas, Canada's Life Sciences Innovation Summit. This is an in-person event taking place in Hamilton on the first Monday in October. The Next Great Big Ideas Summit is an event for innovators, disruptors, academics, suppliers, and investors who want to meet leaders and startups in Canada's life sciences community. For more details, check out nextgreatbigideas.com. Hamilton was arguably the economic backbone of Canada, and the irony is not lost on me that it's looking like it's going to be the a similar economic backbone for the next generation of the Canadian economy. Keeping my fingers crossed that government gets on board even more so than they have to help make this happen, and which leads me to my next question. There's a significant lack of wet lab space, not only in Ontario, but right across the country. And it's needed for scaling biotech companies in particular so they can grow. 
And I'd appreciate your thoughts on what MIP is doing to help address that situation. There's all sorts of talk. Everybody's talking about the lack of wet lab space and absolutely is. But I think we have to break wet lab space into more regions. Lab space for basic research is different than startup space is different than scale up space. And I think when you look at the region, and I'm going to argue that this is true, not just for our region, but frankly, across Canada, we actually have capacity at the large scale. So if you think Pill Hill and Mississauga, we have the ability to produce pharmaceuticals there. If you think about early stage startups spinning out of universities, whether it's at Mars, Hamilton's Flex Labs, London and Kingston and Ottawa, we're generating startups. And these startups are attracting capital. And that's amazing. But what happens when they have more than a dozen or so people? And the answer is there's nowhere to grow, at least regionally. And so that means one of two things. We either export them to other regions. Most people end up in either the San Francisco area or the Boston Cambridge area, which is terrible shame because our highest potential ventures have to leave just when they're getting <laughs> commercial reality. Another scenario is, is they stay where they are in the incubation space and they clog up the pipeline, but they also constrain their dreams. So there's nowhere to grow. So they kind of stay in the, how many broom closets have been converted in, into a lab space? That does two things. It means they're not growing. There's only so far you can grow in that room closet. But it also means that the next generation of innovations have nowhere to start. And everything comes to a stop. If you think of it as a pipeline from discovery to startup to scale up to full commercial reality. And so there's a bottleneck in that continuum. So what MIP is trying to do is bridge that gap between early incubated size companies that are a dozen or so people and full-scale commercial manufacturing, the likes of which you'd see in, in Pill Hill. And we call that graduation space. So our expansion, which includes over a million square feet of life science space, is focused on addressing the needs of those companies that are somewhere in that gap. What we want to do is make sure that if you're a graduate from anywhere in the region, you can graduate to Hamilton instead of graduating to Boston, Cambridge, and eventually, we hope that you graduate beyond MIP as well and make room for the next generation. So we're trying to bridge that gap. And that, that's the role of an innovation park is to support that pipeline. You can call it a pipeline. You can also call it an ecosystem. And, and that's the goal of our expansion. Thank you for that. I, I don't think a lot of people truly understand the process and the stages. Some of the people that don't understand it, who need to understand it, are politicians at various levels of government who I've spoken to, and I'm sure you have, who have said, well, can't seem to be a big problem. We don't hear much about it. But over the years, these companies that you've described who need to find space to grow and have left to go to the States in particular, they haven't made a ripple here when they've left because they made the splash where they landed and went from 20 people to 200 people. We lose the IP, we lose the tax revenue, most importantly, we lose excellent people. I see MIP in particular helping address that situation and excited by the path that is about to be much more public. For the startup founders who are listening, you've had a lot of success in a very varied career. I'd like to ask, what was the biggest loss in your career? How did you overcome it? And what did that loss teach you? Thank you for saying that I've had a lot of success. When I look at my success kind of on industry average, I'm remarkably average. And by that, I mean, you have successes and you have failures. And I think the secret to success isn't not failing, but rather picking yourself up after you fail. The people we should not listen to are the people that come and brag, oh, I've never had a failure and they've done all of this. I, maybe those people are out there. <laughs> I don't find that very credible. I think it's the persistence of getting up and then figuring out where to go. I, I would say maybe on a business failure side, that six imaging company, the satellite, look, we had grand ambitions, we had investors, and then out of nowhere, Google invests in your competition. That was gut-wrenching exercise, and we had to rethink completely what our strategy was for a whole bunch of reasons, including preserving all the capital that we put in. <laughs> I would say if I was going to pick one, that would be it. I would say there's just a string of failures, and we can call them failures, and I promote your failures. 
but there's a bunch of setbacks along the way. That's called life. Yeah, no, it is called life. And what is the biggest learning? I, I think that's where you learn and you have to pick yourself up. It strikes a balance between you need to learn from failure. It's like you can't be so stupid or pig-headed that you're just going to keep bashing into the same walls. That's the same, you know, the definition of insanity. You have to learn when you've hit that brick wall and when you need to turn or pivot. But at the same time, you have to have that confidence that you'll eventually find a path. And not let it define you. Yeah. And I would say, and this, this seems to have been a topic that has come up recently, and we all want solutions and you need solutions. And I think it was Einstein said that if you had a minute to solve a problem, you'd spend 50 seconds defining the problem and then 10 seconds solving it. And I think it's understanding your, the problem you're trying to solve and then trying a solution and, and then continuously tweaking on it. If you use that Einstein analogy, it's that 50 second mark, which is the most critical. So you spent 50 seconds defining the problem and then you're going to spend 10 seconds solving. At 50 seconds, Jim, you know it's solvable, but you don't have the solution yet. Often the trick in these things is being able to move forward, knowing that there is a solution. You'll find it, even though you don't have the solution in hand. Some organizations, some people will be paralyzed until the solution is in hand. And if you do that, then you, you get stuck because solutions take time to develop. And, and I think the trick to innovation is having the confidence to step forward at that point where you know there's a solution, even though you don't know the complete solution. And you have confidence, I know it's solvable, and I know it's in this direction, and if I keep going in this direction, I'll find it. And that takes a little bit of courage and a little bit of luck. I think that 50-second mark in the equation is a really important point. Spend 50 seconds sharpening the knife and 10 seconds gunning. You've been at MIP now for just over four years, Yeah, three of which were during a pandemic. <laughs> Are you still glad you drank the life sciences Kool-Aid? When MIP started, I drank the Kool-Aid. I'm now in charge of selling the Kool-Aid. <laughs> <laughs> so it sometimes seems bizarre to me, Jim, that more than a bit years ago, I couldn't spell life sciences. I was this aerospace guy, and now I'm playing in a domain that I'm I find so interesting. It wasn't my technical domain, and I find it so interesting. I still feel someday somebody's going to figure out that I don't know what the heck I'm talking about. <laughs> it's an amazing domain, and I'm, I'm super happy with where we are, and I think the journey's just started. So we talked about OmnioBio. That's fantastic. Jim, that's the first domino, and we got to tip all the dominoes over. Because that's when we have made the impact. So yeah, I'm, I'm super happy I made it. I could have lived without the COVID pandemic, but it is what it is. <laughs> Looking forward to the next chapter. What's the greatest win in your career and what did that teach you? I'm going to go back all the way back to when I left the Air Force. I think often back that I still miss the armed forces and the camaraderie and the structure that comes with it. It was so terrifying to leave that and venture into the great unknown, which today sounds silly because I've been at it for so many years. I think the greatest success was having the courage to say, I'm going to give this a go. That started the whole ball rolling, the, the dominoes on my career. And so I would say that was the greatest. That is such a wonderful answer. Do you define success differently now than you did 30 years ago? For sure. I'm not going to say it's 180 degrees. When I started and I went to RMC, I was that romantic guy that was looking for an adventure, not just an academic environment. If you look at my career and my hobbies, I have some sort of weird adrenaline junkie. I love solving problems and I love the exciting and startups or investing in startups or supporting startups or creating ecosystems. They all have an element of it's complex and it's not for the faint of heart. And whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, that's what seems to attract me. I seem to be attracted to complexity like a moth to a flame. And that's both a good thing and a bad thing because flames can, can hurt you and you get those failures and stuff. I've reached a point in my career where I start to think about the next generation and I guess leaving a legacy. I've lived mostly in Canada throughout my career. I've had areas, you know, times where I wasn't in Canada. I've really done business in Canada. 
And I worry about Canada. I worry about the next generation. If you think about ecosystems, I think there's a time where you're trying to prosper within the ecosystem. And I've reached a point where I want to invest back into that ecosystem and improve it for the next generation. I wouldn't say that's a new definition, but it, it feels like an evolution in my thinking that I, I want to create a better environment in Canada as opposed to create a better environment for me. And so you've gone from maybe a profit focus to a service focus. I think profit's a really good thing for me personally, and but also for businesses. I think it makes sustainable. I'm starting to think about the country and the region and, and society. And I wouldn't say I've gone from one to another. I think I've expanded my horizons a little bit. What advice would you give to those who are listening to this conversation? I would say we need you. If you think about life sciences, not only is it an industrial sector, but it's saving people's lives. And it's saving people's lives while we're creating jobs and creating wealth and creating GDP. To a great extent, the ultimate ESG area. We're doing well by doing good. I would encourage people to think of it as an area to explore, whether you're 18 or you're 58 and you're thinking about where are opportunities. You don't have to be the CEO to be an innovator. So I would encourage you to find what's the right place for you, whether that's as a member of the team or the leader of the team. In fact, the leader of the team is a member of the team. Be genuine to yourself. Find that passion. Same silly advice. I'm a bit of a broken record that if you find your passion and something that you're good at, then work doesn't feel like work and good things will come. The theme of this podcast is next great big ideas. In your position, you see a lot of really cool stuff come across your desk and walk in the doors at 175 Longwood. What's the next great big idea on your horizon and why do you think it's important? Cell and gene therapy as a new technology is it's going to transform the world from a medicine perspective. It's more than an idea. It's a going concern. It may be an early stage, but it's more than a, an idea. So the latest idea that I've become enthralled with actually isn't life sciences. It's not in aerospace. I've been recently introduced to the concept of SMR, small modular reactors. But if you think about traditional nuclear power systems, there's these giant things that take up swaths of real estate and they're miles and miles away from urban centers. Small modular reactors are these hockey rink size reactors that can get right into a community. When you look at the climate crisis and all of the challenges that we're dealing with that, I think you're going to see a renaissance of nuclear energy. I, I don't think there's any way that we're going to satisfy our carbon objectives without nuclear. And SMR is a completely different way to, to skin the cat. And I think it's hugely transformative and it's happening right in our back door. It's an area of excellence for McMaster University. And I think it's going to change how we electrify our world, whether it's a small community in Nunavut or a sector with, within Hamilton. I think that's a transformative idea. Now, whether I'm part of that or not, if you ask me where I think a great new great idea is, I would say that's the one that, that I've seen recently, and I'm, I'm pretty jazzed about it. Final question. Where will MIP be in five to ten years? Well, MIP will, as a park, as a physical park, will have grown from that 700,000 square feet to millions of square feet uh, to be filled with biotech companies ranging from a twinkle in an eye to fully scaling companies. And my as a company is going to be focused on how do we activate that real estate to, to focus not on the, the infrastructure, but the people and the ventures. And uh, my hope is that it's recognized as the best research park in the world. If I was going to quantify that, I would say I would love to see there was an article in The Economist about how MIP is a model for transforming uh, cities and regions. I love that vision. Ty Shattuck. I appreciate you taking the time today to speak with us. It is always a pleasure, and I always learn something new when I sit back and I listen to, to what you have to say. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Jim. All the best. That was Ty Shattuck, CEO of McMaster Innovation Park in Hamilton. If you'd like to learn more about MIP, check out their website at mcmasterinnovationpark.ca. This podcast is part of Next Great Big Ideas, Canada's Life Sciences Innovation Summit in Hamilton, Ontario. 
For details, please go to nextgreatbigideas.com. This week's episode was researched and edited by Tisha Prasad. If you're interested in following me, I'm on social media at Lab Occupier, and you can email me at jwilson at leonard, that's L-E-N-N-A-R-D, dot com. Thanks so much for listening.